Hi everyone, welcome to the Bowlers Union podcast. With me as usual is uh, is Keith, fresh from a, a day in the dirt today, uh, and we have a very special guest, Aaron Briggs. Now, Aaron, your social media bio you you describe yourself. I can barely say it. A sports aerodynamicist. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so my credentials are basically that I did a PhD in the aerodynamics of swing bowling. So it's funded by the ECB. Uh, so basically just to look into the science of swing and trying to uncover all the myths and law and really put some science behind how it all works. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. And I, so I finished that in 2022. And then sort of since then, I've been working in cricket as a bit of a data analyst, but kind of one step removed from like a usual cricket analyst. So looking at big data and trying to provide some science and turn that into sort of coachable points for analysts to then um, go and give to coaches and players. Brilliant. Well, we appreciate you actually got in touch with us, didn't you, after you listened to our podcast on swing. And I referenced, I'll put it up here. I referenced this book yeah. uh, called Hitting Against the Spin, which I highly recommend people read if they, if they enjoy cricket and they want to know dig into it a little bit um and you contributed to the chapter about swinging it is that correct yeah so nathan nathan lehman who was a co-author on the book so he was kind of my ecb contact throughout the phd so for the four years i was doing it we would give presentations to him sort of about the findings the the useful stuff we've discovered trying to explain the different bits about swing so he was writing the book at the time so i think there's an analogy in it about sort of water flowing around a river um, yeah. And sort of how you can use that to visualize different types of airflow around a cricket ball. So that's something we talked about a lot. Um, so there's some of the science that sort of goes into that came from the, the study I was doing. Awesome. Keith, this I, is up your have, street, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, yeah, it is. And I'm not going to ask you the five quick, quick, quick fire questions. I'm just going to ask you one question. As you play cricket and you enjoy cricket, um, swing or net? It's, it's just swing every time, right? It's just... <laughs> The best thing about cricket is watching swing bowling. And I say that as someone who can't do it myself. I'm a completely useless bowler. Um, I'm actually a batter, so I don't know why I love it so much. But yeah, just to me, it's always been the, the best thing about watching cricket and red ball cricket, especially. Um, so, yeah, we, I mean, we expected that. We're glad you said that. If you'd have said seen, that would have thrown the podcast a little bit. <laughs> um, in, in terms of the, the book itself, then, can you, can you kind of give us... Uh, a very a, a dumbed down version of your excellent chapter uh, and what makes the ball swing. So just to point out, I didn't actually write any of the chapter. That's all credit goes to Nathan and Ben. But yeah, so the, the general science behind. So whenever you're trying to get a ball to swing, what you're trying to do is create different airflow on either side of the ball. Uh, that's like the underlying principle. And a lot of people talk about the seam being a rudder uh, and kind of moving the air behind it. And that analogy doesn't quite work. So if you think about a rudder behind a boat, that kind of just pushes water to one side and then obviously the boat moves in the opposite direction. Um, but for conventional swing, what you're trying to do is get the seam to basically change the airflow on one side uh, so it sticks to the ball for longer. And that's basically the underlying uh, mechanism of how it works. And then you have the air sticking to the ball for longer on one side and then leaving a bit earlier on the other. That pushes the air behind the ball in one direction and it's Newton's third law, I think it is. So equal act, every action has an equal and opposite reaction that moves the ball in the other way. So yeah, you're you're shaping the air around the ball, and that's what gets it to swing. Sorry, apologies. Which which side of the ball does the air stick to more? Ah, uh, yeah. So this is actually quite a common misconception. I've got a cricket ball here because obviously I'm going to need this for. Uh, this is you're nice. More this is than us. This is a proper. <laughs> 2019 Duke's ball as well. These are in rare supply. This is like a, a proper artifact here. Um, yeah, so so what actually happens is people think often you, you talk about sort of clean air and dirty air. So there's the, the technical terms are turbulent flow and, and laminar flow. So turbulent flow would be sort of dirty air that you get when air flows over a rough surface. And people think that what it does is that the turbulent air has more drag on it. So you're kind of slowing one side of the ball down and speeding the other up. Um, yeah. And actually, it's the other way around. So the turbulent air sticks to the ball for longer. So say I'm bowling towards you, right? So I'm bowling right arm over. I'm trying to shape the ball away from a right-hander. I'm pointing this at first or second slip, right? Nice. The air is hitting the ball at the front. And then on this side, the side where the seam is angled, the air's then got to hit the seam, this big, chunky, you know, rough patch. And that's going to yep. make the airflow on one side essentially stick to the ball for longer, um, which actually speeds it up. Kind of weirdly uh so it speeds up on one side and then this side it it separates kind of near the middle and then the air gets kicked 
the other way, and then that stays right. So it sticks to the side where the seam is for longer. And that's basically why your angled seam is the most important thing for getting a ball to swim. Um, you don't need one side to be rough and one side to be shiny if you can angle the seam and get the seam to do the work for you. So I think that's one of the things you guys said about in the last podcast was like, you can't get the ball to swing unless you you nail your seam position. And that's like the number one uh, thing that we found from sort of a bowler perspective. But just from uh, like, obviously, just hearing what you said there about the uh, air sticking to one side of the ball for longer. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. So when we're shining the ball and we've been told like you need to get heat into the ball, you need to get it shiny yeah. and smooth. Is that actually benefiting the ball to swing more or it's i said so so the smoothness is the thing right so people talk about shiny and rough side and that's that's kind of one of the most important things obviously is the ball itself um and so when you say smooth that's kind of the thing that the air cares about right so the air is flowing over the surface it needs to be smooth rather than shiny that's kind of the thing but it, it makes a massive difference the surface of the ball massively influences how the air flows past it kind of unsurprisingly so that's why you shine it because you want the air to do certain things and just kind of just to take a, a little step back, when we were sort of doing the research in, in general, the easiest way to think about swing is that there's loads of different variables that, that go into it. We've already talked about seam position. We've already talked about the ball, right? So the way we kind of structured the project was to split the different variables up into like three different groups. If that makes sense? So the first one is everything to do with the bowler, right? So how you let go of the ball, the seam position, the speed that you're bowling, uh, the rotation you've got on the ball, is the seam wobbling or not? That's kind of like one bucket. Uh, the second one is the ball itself. So is it new? What's the seam doing? How much have you polished it? Uh, how many overs old? How rough is it, et cetera? And then the last one is like the conditions, right? Let's say conditions with inverted commons because it means lots of different things. Um, but what we mean sort of from a swing perspective is what's the air around the ball doing? So Obviously, for, for a ball to swing, it's got to travel through a block of air. Uh, so how does the weather affect that? How does other bits and pieces change the air around the ball? Um, so, yeah, when you're talking about the ball and shining it, it, it's massively important. It's like, you know, you can't get a ball to swing no matter how good you are if it's not in the right condition. Um, it kind of works for basically if one of those three groups isn't working properly, you aren't going to get the ball to swing. That's why it's so hard to do. Uh, it's why it's one of the things that sort of feels a bit mysterious because it can sort of come and go at, at will because you've got all these variables at play. So, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Keith, Keith and I are, well, our teammates probably hate us in how we demand a yeah. really high standard of ball shining. Like, it, you know, we were always told, weren't we, growing up, that is that is your, the batsman's got their bat and all that, and we, all we have is the ball. And obviously, batsmen hit it, it gets thrown about and all that, so we've got to look after it um, like it's, you know, a little baby kind of thing. Um, so it's good to know that, it is important. Um, now, Keith, Keith touched on what was the question you just asked, Keith? It was about heat, wasn't it? Yes. So, yeah, this is a, this is the thing I hear quite a lot about heat in the ball, right? So, yes. You know, bear in mind, I've never been on a first class cricket field. Like you guys have much more experience in, in ball management and what happens on the, the pitch than I do. But in terms of the like heat element to it, the ball actually being warm itself doesn't make any difference. But if you think about how you get heat into the ball, you've got to rub it really hard, right? Yep. And it gets hot because of friction. Uh, and what does friction do? It smooths out a surface. You're essentially making it as smooth as possible by getting heat into the ball. You're, you're rubbing all the rough bits where you're making it flat, you're making it smooth. And that's really important to get the ball to swing conventionally, right? Because you need a shiny side uh, to give you that contrast. So this is the thing I sort of um, ask players and stuff as well. Like, What's the best condition for a ball to swing from your guys' perspective? Like, If you, if you could pick a, a ball in any way you'd like, how would you design it? In terms of management to make it swing as best as possible. Well, um, lack of, lack for me, lacquer has to be off. Um, it is, I, yeah, you're trying to get the lacquer off as soon as possible. Even um, also, especially here, playing just playing today, there was an instance where the ball got a little bit soft, but it was in still in good condition where it's shining up quite nicely. One side was a little bit rough, um, but it got a bit soft. And wasn't doing as much as it had done. But as soon as we, we got cloud cover, so it's quite warm, but a bit of cloud cover really changed the, the dynamics of how that ball moved. And I wanted to ask you why that would be potentially. What's the difference of a uh, sun out, but then still quite quite a lot of heat. But as soon as a bit of cloud cover, why is that then the ball moves more? Yeah, the, the cloud cover thing is something I got asked a lot. And just from like a raw science thing, 
there isn't really any way that the clouds can like directly change the air around the ball. So I know it's like the thing that people will, will hang their hat on most than anything, but what you end up doing is essentially getting some conditions that the clouds will change that will then help the ball swing a little bit more. So the general, the general thing you're looking for, for a, a good sort of like air conditions for swing is warm and still. They're the like two highlights. So if it's a little bit warm, um, then the air is a little bit less dense, which basically means you can swing the ball at higher speeds. That's like just how the, the science works. Um, and then the wind and like the stillness of the air, basically, you know how I talked about there being sort of like clean and dirty air before, right? And you need one side yeah. to be dirty and one side to be clean. Uh, if there's a lot of wind around, then essentially the background air is always dirty. So it's always turbulent. So that when you're bowling, there's no way you can get clean air on one side if the air you're bowling through is turbulent, right? So the, the warm and still are like the two things we kind of hang our hat on from a, a physics perspective. And then when the clouds come over, it, it's a tricky one because it, it's not necessarily going to immediately change what happens with the ball in the air. But sometimes it, you know, cools the air down a bit. There's less wind when there's cloud, other bits and pieces. Um, my real like belief in this is that it's kind of a bit of a placebo effect, right? So it's like people believe the ball is going to swing more so they nail their skills better so it does swing more like if it's warm and sunny and you're like ah this isn't going to do anything i'm not going to try and swing the ball i'm going to hit my wobble seam i'm going to just bowl length suddenly the cloud comes over and you go oh you know what i'll push it up i'll get this to shape and then suddenly it does it's kind of this like a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing um yeah. again it it's really hard to like prove or disprove this because it's like a, a raw data thing that you can't really look at um but yeah, there's like a big idea that if you don't try and swing the ball, it's not going to. And if you don't think the conditions are good, you're not going to try and swing the ball. So that kind of leads into it. I don't know. Again, that might be just be me uh, telling you that you're believing in fairies, but like that's not what it's meant to sound like. No. Uh, I, so I think that makes perfect sense, actually, because I think Keith would agree on this. When it's It can definitely be too cold, right? So if it's cold, quite often yeah. it doesn't swing. Yeah. Um, now... However, reading reading that book, I would have thought that cool air or a cool surface of the pitch meant it would swing because the air would be it wouldn't be so turbulent. Or have I got that wrong? No, yeah. So that, that's that's another theory as well. So it's the idea that you know I said before, like if it gets too windy, you have too much just turbulent air in general. So there's another way that people think you get turbulent air. So the idea is that yeah. when the sun heats the pitch, uh, the pitch gets really hot and gets hotter than the air around it. And you basically get heat haze, you know, like you see on a road or whatever else. That heat haze is turbulent air. That's what it is. You can see it because it's turbulent and all messed up. So there's this idea that if you bake a pitch really hot, then it's going to generate turbulence, which is going to stop the ball swinging. So actually, one of the things we did during my PhD was take a little weather station. I've actually got down here. Um, and we sat in the middle of a few cricket grounds over the course of the summer of 2020. It would have been lockdown summer. So I sat in the middle of Headingley for like three days. Uh, just in the, on the square, just measuring everything I could about the air above the pitch, including the temperature of the air, how much turbulence there was, the wind, everything else. And we couldn't really find uh, any evidence of that happening in England, right? It just doesn't get hot enough. You never really get to the stage where you get a real blistering heat haze coming off the pitch. Um, but there's a theory that, you know, out in Australia and other places where you really bake that pitch, it's definitely something that could happen. So that's the idea behind it being cooler. It's cooler, less likely to get heat haze, less likely to get turbulent air. Therefore, it's easier to swing the ball. Um, so but I don't think it's a big factor, basically. Th that theory would support the kind of uh, the old school bowling view of in the morning it does a bit more because presumably the pitch warms up if the sun's out. And then in the evening, when it's a bit cooler, maybe it does a bit. And the middle of the day, I'm just trying to put all these kind yeah. of it's, so well, this is the problem, right? There's so many things at play that it's very hard to just say there's one thing that's the most important. Because no matter how good the conditions are, if you don't know your skills, it's not going to swing. If you don't maintain the ball, it's not going to swing. So it's kind of like there are these general trends that are true, but for any given instance, it's really hard to pinpoint the exact thing. Um, so yeah, there, there's I always get asked about under lights as well, right? So that's the other classic one, like the ball does a bit more under lights. And actually, I'm doing a bit of work looking at pink ball cricket at the moment now and the sort of general trends for that. Um, and so one of the other theories about sort of playing under the lights at night is that, you know, when the sun goes in, the air just cools down. Uh, and what you essentially get is inside a stadium, you get a load of trapped air. The air can't go anywhere. It's all really cold and, and dense. So then there's no wind. It's incredibly still. And then that's really good for swing. 
So there's like all these other little bits that feed into it. But in terms of the actual importance of conditions, I think it's kind of the third thing on that list. So, you know, it talks about the bowler, the ball, and then the conditions. I actually think the conditions is quite a long way down that list because the changes that you see are kind of small uh, compared to, say, for example, you're just not nailing your seam position. It's never going to swing if you do that, no matter what the air thing. Or if you have a ball that you can't shine properly, it doesn't matter what the conditions are doing. So sometimes what you see is people making a decision based on the conditions when they think it's not going to be favorable when actually if they try to swing the ball they might um and there's actually a question i was going to ask you guys because i've been listening to a few podcasts around sort of like jimmy retiring obviously you know the the best swing bowler to ever do it yeah one of the things people say is like he works out the conditions really quickly he understands if it's going to swing or not uh, on a given day and for me it feels like that could sometimes be a little bit dangerous because if say for example you've got a brand new ball and it's not swinging, you haven't got the lack off it yet, you bowl your first two or three overs and it doesn't do much. If you give up on swing because you're like, oh, it's not going to swing today, you're kind of missing out on, on all those opportunities later in the day if you just say we're going to hit our lengths and bowl wobble seam for the rest of the day. So how often yeah. is bowls when you're out in the middle, do you think, well, I'm going to try swinging the ball now? Like it hasn't well, done anything with 10 overs, but what if we tried it? I, the ball kind of looks like it might do something, for example. Well, normally this is perfect question, actually. So I was bowling at right-handers today a lot and I always come around the wicket and it got to a stage where I felt that they were probably getting a little bit comfortable. So rather than me bowl around the wicket, wobble seam with the odd one shaping away from them, I then jumped over the wicket to what right, right we talked about swing the other day and I said how really swinging it back to a right-hander, I'm not as keen as I used to be. Um but they found it a little bit more difficult and than what I thought they would. So obviously you, you get going, you get a bit more like kind of, all right, let me really commit to it and start to swing it more myself, but on a good line and length and it caused a bit of trouble. Um, so I, yeah, I think you've got to always, you always want to assess and go with what your strength is, but this is a problem with a lot of more younger bowlers. And I think that the younger bowlers need to work on their skills more is that if you've only got one dimension, one if you're only one dimension of bowling, then you can't, you can't do anything else. So you've got to really learn, like you said, about wrist position, getting the seam to come out correctly, to be able to learn to swing the ball. And then you learn your wobble seam and all that stuff. So going back to your, your question, I think you always want to go to your strength for that batsman or the weakness, whatever it is, but you've got to be adaptable enough to go, right, look a little bit settled. I've got to try something else. And that for me today was swinging the ball from over the wicket. So my, my take on that would be that um, when uh, you hear Jimmy is assessing the conditions or most, most see most swing bowlers out there or whatever, you're actually probably you're assessing the effect, the wicket, is directly having on the ball. So, Ed, you know, a game the where exactly what you said, I remember Anderson was bowling at Edge Baston against India um, a few years ago. And he went, to, what, he went to wobble seam quite quickly. Can you remember? Yeah, yeah. I, there was, I was in the India game at Edge Baston in, I don't know, it might have been Lords in 20. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I think I know the one you're talking about. So he opened up. It didn't swing loads, but he went to wobble seam quite quickly. And obviously we know what edge baston can be like and especially in recent years it isn't really it can it can be hard work yeah um and i think that he would have probably gone i can't keep the ball in good enough condition especially since since covid and you can't yeah, yeah. you know it's alive on the ball which 100 percent has an effect um he's gone right i can't look after the ball well enough to swing it consistently Therefore, I will bowl a lot more wobble seam because it's the gives him the most control. It's still threatening. I think I think that's what you see. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's more. It's probably more logical than perhaps it's pitched. Do you know what I mean? Just, yeah. a bit of a... just with that. Sorry. Just with that. Jumping onto white ball here, because you always try and swing a white ball early on. But I'd be interested to see what your answer is. Because you might swing the ball for maybe two overs and then you quickly have to change because it just stops swinging. Yeah. But why is it that a white ball, as we spoke about, doesn't swing for as long as a red ball? Yeah, so so actually just to, just to quickly go back to the idea about the condition stuff, that's really like exactly what I was asking. When you're thinking about conditions, is it what is the pitch and the outfield doing for the ball? Can I maintain the ball itself to mm. a condition where I can keep it swinging for, for longer, right? Because that to me is like 
hundred percent logical. If you know you're not going to be able to polish the ball up, you're not going to be able to swing it. There's no point in, in gunning for that. Uh, the the white ball question is an interesting one. So um, it's actually one of the things. So pre the middle of my PhD was during the 2019 World Cup, and they actually asked us about about white balls and, and why they don't swing as much and other bits and pieces. And actually, one of the biggest differences between red balls and white balls is just the way that the leather itself is finished. So with your red ball, it's like dyed and there's a layer of grease into it and then your lacquer goes on the top. And then on top of that, you put the logos. Um, so this is another thing about new balls as well. You know, talk about getting the lacquer off. One of the things you find is that actually the logos themselves, which are stamped on the lacquer, can actually be quite rough, uh, which will stop a new ball swinging. So you have to polish that logo off. Uh, it's one of the things I tell people when they're picking the ball is like get your thumb, run it over the middle of a ball. So like if I take this huge ball here, I can feel different parts of this, you know, quite quite large logo here. I can feel that that's rough. There's no difference from that and a big scuff on the ball. So I need to get that off the ball before it's going to be shiny. Uh, so that's like one of the biggest things. Can you then, can you do us a favour quickly? Hold that yeah. ball up a minute and show both sides. So professional always shine, cricketers always, always shine the other side. Always, yeah, you always shine the other side with a smaller logo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's a sensible thing to do because the bigger logo is your bigger possible patch of roughness in the middle. But sometimes, you know, the the other logo's awful as well. Like it's really deep and indented. In which case, you again, you've got to work really hard to get that off. So when you're thinking about white balls, you have the same problems. But the difference between a white ball and a red ball is you can't shine it once you get the lacquer off, right? There's no, when you're actually shining a red ball, you're kind of dissolving the grease in the yeah. ball and then using yeah. that to smooth it into the rest of it and polish it up and make it shiny. It's kind of like when you polish up some leather shoes, right? You're getting some external grease and you're polishing the leather up to make it shiny. It's what you do with a cricket ball, but you use the grease that's already in it. Uh, yeah, for we white, don't use anything external. Ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, that's yeah, Always. definitely not my remit is ball tampering. That's, I'm not an expert in that. Um, so for a white ball, it's painted, right? It's like painted and like there's no grease in the ball. You, there's nothing to polish. There's nothing to shine. So, you know, I've used the white ball and seen what they're like after a few overs. They like crack. They, they yeah. basically crack and split and you can't repair that. And once it's cracked or split, it's no longer a shiny side. One of the biggest culprits is like the quarter seam that runs around the middle. I don't know if I've got any, I might have a white ball down here somewhere, or at least a red ball with Got loads of cricket balls knocking around. So yeah, like so this is a, a kookaburra ball here, right? So you can see the quarter seam that runs down the middle, right? That's kind of already started to split open. Now, as soon as that splits open, it doesn't matter how shiny the rest of the ball is. It's it's a big gap down the middle of the ball, which is going to stop it swinging. It, it doesn't make so with a white ball, if that splits or you get a crack in it, that's no longer a shiny side. It's not smooth enough to keep the ball swinging. And you can't repair it. So that's basically, you know, the, the problem with the ways the ball is just how the different balls are made. Okay. I feel like every sentence you say, I'll come up with another question and it's really throwing how I was going to structure or try to <laughs> structure this. I, there was um, a question I was going to follow up on on there. How would you like the ball condition to be that I haven't even got to yet? But we'll, we'll come back to that at some point, which is like another thing about ball condition. But I suppose we're still talking about it at the moment. Yeah, this, this, this is. Yeah. OK, OK. Changing sides. So this is something in the past that really winds me up, right? Uh, is that if it's not swinging much? So let's say let's say you put thirty overs of effort into shining one side of the ball, and then someone will say, "Oh, should we change sides?" Right? So, am I right in thinking that you cannot just swap sides and then do that one up, or not like you know what I mean? So this leads me actually perfectly into what I was going to say, which is the best thing you can do is shine both sides of the ball, right? Whoa! So, no. so this is really... This is, okay. anyway, so I know everyone's going to hate this, right? Because it goes against everything everyone thinks. But actually, I've talked to a few people, um, you know, some of the coaches I've done to, and they were like, yeah, yeah, we used to do this all the time, right? So when I was going back to what's the best condition you could possibly have a ball in for swing, it's talks about getting the lacquer off the ball. And what if you have a brand new ball where the lacquer's off both sides... You're going to be able to swing that right really nicely. It's going to it's going to swing both sides. Both sides are still shiny, but because you can nail your seam position, you're going to get it to swing right. You don't need the rough side to move the ball in the air. You can do it with two shiny sides and your seam position, right? That's like a fair fair assumption. So yeah. why do you need the rough side? What do you, what is the purpose of the rough side? And actually, think... scientifically, the rough side this is this is going to go against everything. It makes it swing less. <laughs> If you if you make one side rough and one side shiny, it swings less than a ball with two shiny sides. Like just <laughs> we, we, like categorically, it's wild. So, so this, this is unreal. Is, yeah. So so we the way we run the experiments, just as sort of a background for this, is we use a wind tunnel, right? So 
you fix a ball in the tunnel and you blow the air past it at 90 miles an hour because that's the same as the ball traveling through the air at 90 miles an hour as someone is bowling it. So that's how we used to run the experiments is you basically just blow the air past it and you can change all the variables. You can say, okay, I'm going to change my seam position. I'm going to change the roughness on either sides of the ball. And the most you get the most swing when both sides are shiny. And you, you basically just angle the seam, new ball, both sides are shiny, and it swings. And if you can swing a new ball, you can swing a ball with two shiny sides for as long as you like. Right. Well, I just you want to go, Keith. On that. Go on, go on. I, just, I think the reason why that happens and no one shines the rough side is because you do get some lads who present the seam well enough, but they do yeah. clip one side that ends up becoming rough. So people neglect yeah. that side. To just well, if we keep we, you broke, just shine one side, try on one side. But that's I'll be trying. So, that. so the, the, the extra bonus of shining both sides of the ball, right, is exactly what you just said. Is it means you can switch sides when you're going halfway through. You've got two bites of the cherry, right? You need one side at least to be shiny. So why not have two that are shiny? So that if you get slapped into the fence and it hits the stands and you get a big scuff out of the ball, well then you can flip it over because you have been working on both sides for thirty overs. So you still have a shiny side, but now you've got two shiny sides rather than one. I think that the and I look, I I'm I'm I love this right. So the two things I'm thinking here are, um, not everyone presents the seam as well as as they should, right? So that so in that that assumption there, a bowler who isn't presenting the seam perfectly then gets help from having a rough. A hundred percent. Yeah, that's exactly okay. that's exactly right. Um, right. So if, this tactic only works if you're good enough to swing a brand new ball or a ball with a lacquer off, right? So if you had a team of Jimmy Andersons. That's yeah. the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But Which... you know, I think that any, you know, especially at county level, anyone who's swinging the ball is swinging the new ball, right? Like, it's very rare that you have. You, You'd be often... surprised. You'd be surprised. <laughs> I, 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 from, you know, from watching the video, people are presenting a good enough scene from my perspective that you can get away with shining both sides of the ball. Um, and, and as I say, get the lacquer off both sides, make them both smooth. You get the most swing and it, you get two bites of the cherry. It's like an absolute no brainer. The only thing is it just requires a little bit more obviously effort in the field, but if you're doing yeah. it anyway. Well, the, the other the other point is, let's assume everyone does have a brilliant scene position, is that if you have one side that you leave and one that you're smoothing out and shining, is that then you can then reverse it if required. Yeah, okay, so this is this is really nicely leading us on to reverse another bits and pieces, right? Because that's, that's true. So in order to get the ball to reverse, you need a rough side, right? You need that contrast between one side of the ball and the other. But how many games have you guys played in where you've gunned for conventional swing for as long as possible? God, oh, yeah, we're going to swing it, swing it, swing it, swing it, swing it. And then it stops swinging and you go, oh, great, let's quickly go and get the ball to reverse. Like, it feels often that you kind of want to gun for one or the other. So the real tactic, the real sort of example of this I, I reference all the time because it was awesome is England and Pakistan, I think it was the end of 2022, right? So brand new ball. They got, I think it was Brody, just a bowl cross seam bouncers from ball one. Because they were like, There's, we're never going to shine this ball. We're never going to keep it shiny. Let's get it to reverse as quickly as possible. And they were reversing the ball after 15 overs. If you take the sort of other side of that coin, which is, you know, playing in the county championship in April or May, how, what are the chances you're ever going to get that ball to reverse before you swap at 80 overs? Like, pretty low? So why yeah. not just gun for conventional swing for as long as you possibly can? Because that's your main weapon. No, no it's, a, it's a good point. I think especially when there's been moisture around, I, I found that quite frustrating when you're like, there's no way we can get it to reverse. So let's not even engage in it. There are, we, we were quite good at it, Keith, back in the day, we had Jeeps that would bowl a lot. So yeah, we, yeah. we at Warwickshire a few, a few years back, we could probably go, you know what, we'll give it a crack for 25 overs of, of swinging it. Then Jeeps will do his thing. And obviously spinners, good example, lots more hitting the ball, the ball, yeah. Is on the square a lot more, um, and it deteriorates, and then you can get it reversing. So, if, in the right circumstances, you can do both. But but I, I, it's not like a long time, right? Like, how long would you expect? If you're like in perfect shining condition, how long would you expect to conventionally swing a Duke's ball for? Like 40, 50 overs, right? Like, you, you should be able to keep that ball going for a decent amount oh, of time. Yeah, eighty. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest, right. with you, we we just bowled and literally up to the eightieth over, it probably would have still swung if we really wanted it to. Yeah, so in those, it's that's the time of condition where you're like, well, let's just shine both sides of the ball. Because then, if you have a, an awful incident where, as I say, it gets pumped into the stands or something and you get a big scuff out of it that you can't polish out, you can do exactly what you were talking about before and just flip over and you got another bite of the cherry. So, there, there is definitely a suboptimal tactic if you think reverse is going to be really important or if you need that rough side to get the ball to shape, 
But if you don't need either of those things, there's no reason not to shine both sides of the ball. And like I, you know, so I, this is part of the the talks I give to coaches and stuff. And some people love it, and some people hate it. Um, and it, but it's like a, it's just a, a categorical fact that when you stick a ball in a wind tunnel, it swings more if you, you yeah, shine both that's sides. Amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Absolutely I'm amazing. getting you on speed dial, because um, mm. this is this is. Um, you know what we could do, Keith? We could basically take – how can we take a picture of the ball? You could sneak into the umpire's room, take a picture of the ball, message Aaron, <laughs> say, Aaron, this is the condition Which... of the ball. What's, so you know this is mean? one of the hardest things. So this is actually – it's a really interesting point. So so one of the things I – you know, when I say I work in sort of data science and stuff in cricket, one of the things we do is we support analysts by looking at data live during games. So, you know, I love my spreadsheets. I love my dashboards. Um, and so – when you're thinking about swing, you can track what the bowlers are doing. Like you can watch the footage and you can see who's hitting their speeds and their seam angles and stuff. And you can track what the weather's doing because you can measure it. One thing it's really hard to track is the ball. So if people are like, oh, why is it not swinging? Well, I can rule out two things. I can either be like, well, the bowlers aren't nailing their skills. We can see it on the video. We can see it in the data. And the weather shouldn't be stopping you doing it. So you need to work on the ball, right? But you can't do that. You can't take pictures and measure it. And there's there's so many different bits to a ball that kind of make it smooth or not. But yeah, I mean, like, as I say, lots of variables, um, but shining both sides in general is just my like number one headline. Go and do it. Um, okay. That, um, uh, sorry, Keith, go ahead, go ahead. But that, that is an absolute bombshell that you've just dropped. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, talking of the balls and stuff, talk to me about kookaburras. Yeah. Well, it's obviously been like quite an uh, interesting topic for the last couple of weeks with the, the trial and stuff. So would you want to know just sort of like the main differences between them and, and... why they're so crap? <laughs> no, I'm not allowed to flag anyone off in terms of the ball manufacturers. It's probably quite detrimental to my career in general if I start telling everyone that um, certain cricket balls are, are better or worse than others. But there, there's noticeable differences between them, right? Obviously, you have a, a hand-stitched duke and a machine-made kookaburra. The, one of the biggest things I would say when looking for them is the quarter seams, right? Is that split down the middle? I think it's a thing that people underestimate about the ball, um, yeah. is that it doesn't matter how shiny you can get it, if there's a noticeable gap that you can feel with your finger and thumb, like it's not swinging. Um, and so the Dukes, because it's hand stitch, has often got a really tight quarter seam, like you can hardly notice it on the one I've got here. Kookaburras, some of them, because of the manufacturing process, some of them just split a bit more. Uh, and that would be the main thing outside of just like the prominence of the seam and other bits and pieces which again like you know you know that if you have a less prominent seam you're going to get less less movement off the deck and that's kind of just straightforward um the other kind of main differences i know I talked about this before about like shining the ball and the amount of like grease and stuff in the ball so the dukes is designed for england it has quite a high like grease content in it which means you can shine it for longer the cooker bar is designed for australia south africa where the pitch is abrasive. It doesn't get wet. It doesn't need the grease to stop the ball getting soft because it's, it's just not wet out there, which means that it abrades quicker, which means it's great for reverse, right? If you want to get that ball rough, you don't have to get through as many layers of grease to get it rough to get it to reverse. But it also means that, for example, if you use it in April in the UK, it's just going to get wet really quickly because there's not enough grease to protect the ball. Um, so that's kind of like a, a manufacturing difference between them. That makes a lot of sense because obviously we discussed about the time of the season when to use the cooker ball um because like you said as soon as it gets wet it's yeah. it's done for um and then it becomes an absolute run fest um so that makes a lot of sense and a lot like you said about a lot of the uh, grease not greasing the ball obviously doesn't help so would you agree that using a cooker ball, ball mid-season would work a lot better for the game itself so so from my perspective, the like kookaburra ball thing is like, what are you trying to achieve by using it? Well, you're trying to like put forward skills that may not be as prominent when you're using a Duke's ball. And those are, you know, high bowling speeds. You need you need to bowl quicker with a kookaburra ball because it's doing less for you off the surface. You need that element of speed. You want to try and promote reverse swing because again, high speed and reverse swing, they they link together. They're all part of it. They're part of what makes you successful overseas. When you're when you're playing in South Africa, Australia, and then you're trying to promote uh, spin bowling as well, right? So so high quality spin, preferably wrist spin, to get the ball to move. So if you're thinking about what are the best times a year to use a ball to promote high speed and reverse swing, well, it's going to be when you can get that ball into the right condition and, and rough it up. So I know there's a couple of rounds coming up in August. You know the the classic reverse swing test we kind of get every year is September in Old Trafford, right, where you have 
15 wicket ends that are all really rough. That ball is going to get rough. It's dry. And that, for me, is when you want to be using the ball that promotes those skills. You want to be looking for high speed and reverse, but you need the conditions. And that includes pitches, outfields uh, that are going to allow you to do that. Um, yeah, that's kind of kind of how I see that whole experiment being really good. Mm. Yeah, spot on. I agree with you both. I'm just thinking there. So the issues with the kookaburra for swing, this is just for everyone. I'm just going to try and sum that up because I've been yeah. paying attention. The seam isn't that proud. The, Which actually uh, isn't that important for swing. Kind of, this I, is another little, I'll, I'll let you finish, then we'll, we'll sort of come to this, I guess. Well, yes, it's not. But when you factor it in, the fact that you can't shine it particularly well, and oh, the core shine, team yeah. is, is, is average in a lot of cases, then those three are basically like, they're all back, they're all poor. You know what, just to, add all... to that, can I just add to that actually is, when the seam is not prominent, I feel like it's harder to present the seam as well as you'd want to. Yeah. Um, so there's that, it... that whole, you know, how the ball feels in your hand thing, right? Like, yeah. again, this is a thing that you guys are going to know infinitely better than me. Uh, but like, physically, you need to nail your skills. You need to be able to present that seam when you're letting go of the ball. And if the ball in your hand doesn't feel like you can grip it or rip down the back of the seam and get that backspin to stabilize the seam, it's obviously going to be harder. So, yeah, that's all part of it as well, how the ball helps you nail your skills or not. So this might sound like a weird question. Um, and I've got loads of these little little kind of theories that I want to just fire at you in a bit. Yeah. Love them. The, shape, the shape of the kookaburra, it feels more round than yeah, the like dune. It feels right? more oval. Is that a myth or is that is that a factor? To be honest, I haven't, I haven't sat down and physically measured lots of them as much as, you know, that sounds like a great use of a weekend. Um, but I think it might just be that prominent seam, right? So again, if I, I can sort of show you them in general here. So we've sort of got a kookaburra and a juice. They're, if you look at them at a distance, they're kind of both pretty similar, right? There's no, this one's not obviously any rounder or whatever else. But when you get up close, it's the fact that this has got a raised middle, where are we here? Like a raised middle to the seam, you know, you can really feel that in your fingers. This one is just a lot flatter in general. And so it feels more like an egg. Cricket balls are an egg, right? They're two hemispheres with a with a flat bit in the middle. They are all eggs. Like, that's just how a cricket ball is. But the Dukes feels less like it because it's got a raised bit in the middle. Um, so that's probably... The, the shape itself doesn't really change how it swings. Um, it, like, a, a rounder ball isn't going to swing any more or less than anything else. It's much more about the surface condition than it is the shape. Okay. Um, do you have anything more there on the type of ball, Keith, or not? No, nothing. Nothing, mate. Can I... Can I um... Now, I'm, I might get this wrong. I don't know how well you know all the stats in this book. <laughs> Probably not very well. Um, well, hit well, me with some of them and then... Okay. Well, can you, can you, can you comment at all on um, how that this book says that swinging it into left-handers is better than swinging it away? Yep. In terms of, like, statistically... But then again, it does mention that that's largely because of over the wicket. Yeah, right arm off right? Over. Yeah. And it talks about the more you swing it away, sorry, you don't have to swing it away as much as you do to swing it into a right-hander to be successful. So if you're going to swing it in, you've got to hoop it in a right-hander. Whereas if you swing it away, you need less to be threatening. So, so uh, ladies and gents, uh, Keith just disappeared. Um, I think he's had a long day in the field, so it could have been some cramp or something like that. But either way, it's just me and Aaron now to to finish, unless he jumps back on. Um, where were we there, Aaron? Sorry, I've, I've just lost my train of thought. Just there. talking about like the amount that you need to swing a ball to be effective, right? Essentially, yes. is the general idea. So this is kind of one of my favourite bits when we're talking about swing as well is the difference between actually how much a ball moves and then like the perception of how much a ball moves. So there's all these things that people talk about with swing or like swing from the hand, early swing, late swing, all these other different bits and pieces that are really interesting from like, uh, well, what, what do they mean scientifically? So like taking the cricket language and, and turning it into like some scientific meanings, right? And one of the things that's really interesting, first of all, is that from a science perspective, I don't think late swing exists. That's like one of my hot takes. Um, <laughs> that is a hot take. So, just the, the reason it's a hot take is because actually all swing is late swing. Every every deliver so the way a ball swings through the air is going to get a little bit technical here. Yeah, it, it's what's called a parabola, right? That's what the shape of the curve is, right? It curves through the air. Yeah, and 
what a parabola means is that essentially the further, the longer the ball is in the air, you get kind of exponentially more swing, right? Um, you've all seen the shape of a ball as it flies through the air. It swings a lot in the last third of the flight. Technically, if you, if you do the maths of it, the ball moves, it swings half the amount in the last third of flight. Does that make sense? So say the ball swings, I don't know, two bat widths, 25 centimeters. It's going to swing the last 12 and a half of those in the last third before it hits the batter. No matter what happens, it's all there's all swing swings like that. The, the shape is pretty much consistent. So when you're talking about how much swing you need to be effective, a lot of it is about like angles and perception. So this idea of the ball swinging from the hand. So my theory on this is basically if you're a batter, you're a right arm, right handed batter lining up a right arm away bowler. Right. When is that ball starting to move away from you? If the bowler is bowling like over off stump, it's always moving away from you, right? Like they've got to angle the ball straight and it's always going away. However, if they're jumping from wide on the crease and then angling it into you and then it starts moving away, well, that from a perception standpoint is really different. And so there's that like, yeah. well, when do I notice the ball is swinging? How do I react to it? What's the shape of the, the curve and other bits and pieces? And that's probably the reason why like big away swinger is just not hugely effective because you have to angle it in like a foot down leg and then it's got to hoop loads and straighten and hit off stump and it's just really really hard to do uh, and when it goes wrong it's just a freebie right like i think this is one of the things you guys have talked about before when you try and swing a ball and it doesn't swing it's just a it's a bad ball uh so there's all these like where am i using the crease what are the angles doing uh other bits and pieces so there's all these little factors that play into it um that mean it's not really like a one size fits all it's all about angles and perception and other bits and pieces really interesting to hear your take on late swing swing from the hand all those other bits and pieces yes yeah. so for, no it, that, it, incredible yeah i completely agree so the comment you made just there if you're an away swing bowler and you are too tight you become yeah. quite easy to track definitely for a high quality batter they can track you quite well it doesn't mean you can't you're bowl. Quite a stingy bowler as well right if you're quite a, like big drop your arm like round arm bowler you just you can see that the whole way right like it's just from a from a visual perspective well, you kind of yes no you're, you're right but then if you if you think of someone like fidel edwards yeah oh yeah but then i mean he's like a, a semi malinga type i yeah. wouldn't call him round arm he's kind of more like a slinger i suppose i was thinking the, more like matthew hoggar is like my classic example right like yeah proper you know big c-shape action you can see that ball swinging away I mean, he was an incredible bowler but it felt like it was a swing from the hand type situation and yes. then like the contrast is like your stokes ben stokes is quite or mark woods quite another one where they're often leaning over right really high arm position off the wide of the crease and it's it's not quite the same just angles and tracking so maybe it feels later or, or other bits and pieces so there's that whole element that goes into it it's not just swing it's where's it swinging from how are you tracking it as a batter i think one of my favorite videos that exists is there's a on the ecb youtube page there's just a a uh, video just called Big Swing Deliveries or something. I absolutely love it. It's just great because half of it is just Jimmy <laughs> bowling people for fun. And I think there's like three from a game that Jimmy played against New Zealand where he took eight foot. And it's just people trying to hit him through mid wicket and getting absolutely castled on off stump because he just starts the ball a foot outside leg. Everyone's like, oh, great. This is an easy rut, like easy ball here. And then it swings two foot and hits off stump. And that's that to me is why swinging away from the right hand uh, a lot is really hard because you have to nail those angles if you don't it's just a, a leave me ball uh or a you know a, a wide half volley that you can put away so all of that kind of plays into it when you're thinking about how much a ball is swinging and how effective it is you kind of have to think about angles and other bits and pieces as well because they're not all the same no no you, you're absolutely spot on and i think from a bowling point of view the the, tr the tricky part of swing is figuring out how much it's swinging so you've got to be quite intuitive which is why so many people don't do it because it's easier just to bowl wobble seam yep. um and the answer is you, you know you probably early on in a game or whatever you are probably going to be tight ish and you're going to get it going a bit because it's easier to get the line right from tighter and as you get the degree of swing and you feel more confident you can play around with the angles a bit yeah. um it's quite and hard to do that from the start of a spell. If you're not yeah, of course. And length is the other thing that's really important. So, you know, everyone knows if you pitch the ball up more, it's going to swing more, right? That's just how it works because the ball's got longer time in the air. So a longer time in the air to, for the force to act in the ball to swing. So, like, that's an inherent part of swing as well. So it brings me on to another point, which is, like, how we measure swing. 
So again, because I'm kind of sad I wrote a blog about this because this is the sort of thing I spent my time doing. Like, what what is your blog? This is a good good time. Oh, to, okay, yeah. To so I have about. a I have a I have a uh, okay. It's a Substack that I just write. There's some science bits in there. There's a bit of just general cricket. It's called I think it's just the Swing Doctor at Substack, right? Again, very yeah. cheesy name, but you've got to do it really if you've got a PhD in swing bowling. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yes. so yeah. So like how we measure swing is kind of quite uh, rudimentary at the moment as well. So you use the phrase degree of swing now. That's when you're looking at TV coverage and, and data, that's how swing is measured at the moment. It's measured with an angle, a degree of swing, right? But that's quite a bad measure of swing because an angle tells you the difference between two straight lines, right? And swing doesn't move in a straight line, it's a curve. Um, so what happens is when you say someone's got two degrees of swing, well, that means the ball's moved a certain distance sideways, but it could have been a ball that's hooped miles on a really good length, or it could be a ball that's swung a little bit, but you've pitched it like a yard from the batter so yeah. it's had all that time to swing right so there's a the, some of the stats in 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 nathan's book again it's like hard to really distill down sometimes because you're using a measurement that's kind of dependent on length so yeah. if you can get the ball to swing a certain distance you can either just pitch it up more or you can swing it a lot on a length and that to me is the most effective type of swing you look at jimmy when he's bowling his best he's not just floating up there trying to get them to drive every ball he's shaping off a length and it's consistent 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 and because you can see it going a bit off a length he knows when he pushes it up there it's going to swing even more and that's when you're going to invite the drive that's when you're going to take the wickets there was an example in the ashes um this this last ashes the one the ones in um england 2023 where mitch marsh was bowling right so mitch marsh is quite a classical swing bowler um right arm sort of mid 80s shapes the ball away from a right-handed batter and he he came on to bowl, and I think he bowled three balls, all of which were sort of on a length and swung a little bit. And then he bowled a fourth one, he pitched it up, and I think Zach Crawley had a big drive in it and nicked it to second slip or something, right? Yeah. And that's a really classic example of like how much the ball is swinging is not necessarily indicative of exactly what the ball is doing, but it's what their length is. So I was sat there watching that being like, oh, that's shaping a bit off a length. It pitches it up, it will swing more. And so that's another thing you've kind of got to consider as a bowler is, how much is it going to move when I vary my length? Because it's got more time in the air. It makes it so tricky. There's so many things to to consider on that front. Hmm. Well, no, yeah, this is a, this is a good point, right? So this is where we can marry in that with bowling wise. So Mitch Marsh wouldn't necessarily have been trying to bowl fuller. And I think the point is, like you say, you've got to nail your length, yeah. ideally with a bit of movement. And then if you let's be honest, if you get one wrong and you creep into that slightly fuller territory, that's when you you know yeah you might go for the odd boundary but equally any mistake there and all of a sudden your slips are in play which is it's a wicked ball right like it is you've got a chance and that's no, again exactly. what is awesome from from like a bowling perspective it's like you can get away with a ball that's maybe not as good because it's done something in the air and i know it kind of works the same with sea movement as well right if the ball does anything off the straight it's going to be more effective but there is that element to it where you have that little bit of um freedom to mess around with the length because you've got the sideways movement as well a hundred percent. What isn't so? I tell you, who used to frustrate me quite a bit would be Michael Holding, all right? And yeah. obviously, a lo lovely bowler. But all you'd hear him say was just pitch it up, just pitch it up. <laughs> and it's a bit like it's not as easy as that because obviously you have to you have to control the board to some degree and stuff like that. I don't think necessarily just pitching it up guaranteed anything, but that was all he'd say. And in my head, I was sort of pulling my hair out, thinking it's not. And this is one of the things I think it's it's kind of dangerous to be like, well how much we want the ball to swing to be effective because the length is so inherent to that. If you're like, oh, we just want to swing the ball as much as possible, you're just going to be bowling really full all the time and it's just not an effective tactic. So you need to understand how the two things combine. Um, but yeah, super interesting. As I say, I spent a lot of time looking at data and, and swing data and other bits and pieces, but um, it's cool. I, I really like that kind of discussion of angles and, and all the things you've got. To, I don't envy you guys as bowlers having to do this in your head, right? Like I get to sit on a computer and look at it afterwards. I don't have to do it out in the field. Well, I mean, I'm, I, let's be honest. I, I'm, you know, I'm coming toward the end of my career, and I've so it's 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 quite intuitive. But yeah, the the angles. I wish if I could start again, I would play. For example, my run up. I'd care more about the angle of my run up than the length of it. You know what I mean? But no one tells you that at the start. They're all. You know what I mean? It's like getting that spot on um, is is really important if you're looking to move the ball in the air. Um, can I can I fire some theories at you? And yeah, sure. Yes or no. Answer I'm really bad at giving short answers. Though this is the problem when you spent like 
four years of your life obsessing over one thing is you're really bad at short answers but i'll do my best no no no, no i don't mean short absolutely not i mean i love okay. it ask them however you however you want okay um Duke ball swinging more once the lacquer's off than when it's brand new. True or true or false? So this is what I talked about with the logos, right? It's that yeah. you want the ball as smooth as possible. Often the logo has a bit of an imprint in it. If you get the lacquer off, you can smooth out the logo. You can make the ball smoother. Gives you more swing. Like that is smoothness is the key. So I tell people again, like your thumb and finger are kind of your your most important tools for telling if the ball is going to swing because you can feel roughness a lot better than you can see it. So I know a lot of people when they're picking new balls will like throw them up in the air and go, how does it feel in the hand? All really important, but get your finger on the ball. Just feel it. Like if it's rough, it's not going to swing until you've got the lacquer off it. If it's smooth when it's new, you've got a better chance. So yeah, 100% buy into that theory. Yeah, okay. Um, we've talked a little bit about shining the ball to get heat into it. In reality, you've already said the heat, the heat side of that is a myth and it's actually just the effort you're putting in and the smoothing out that you're doing. And there's a bit of... So this is another interesting thing as well. Did a... A sort of session with Ajman Shazad at Derby. He was he was in Loughborough at the time that I was there, and we were talking about this. And yep. at the top of the mark, really getting some heat into the ball. And I was like, it just feels good in your hand. Like if you're at the top of your mark and you're like, I've got a load of heat in this ball, I'm going to shape this. Like you're gonna, you're more. It's one of these things where you're just more likely to nail your skills and swing it. There's the whole, there's this whole element of how do I feel with the ball in my hand? What am I going to do? Am I going to nail my skills? If you're yeah. at the top of the mark and you've got a ball, you're like, it's hot, it's going to swing, great. Like, I've, you know, nothing against that. By all means, crack on and keep, Spe keep doing it. Speaking of heat, actually, one thing I do find is you want your hand and your wrist to be loose and warm. And that sounds yeah. really trivial. But early in the season, when you're doing your, your friendlies and stuff like that, if it's cold, you lose that little bit of finesse in and like that position in your. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Your feels. Yeah, well, the margins are so fine. This is the other thing as well. Like the the angle of the ball from first slip. Like if you're trying to shape the ball away from someone, you point it. I don't know, first and second slip. The angle of the ball between that and being like, you know, leaking out your hand and pointing down that side. It's like it's like six degrees. Like it's tiny. So the the, the precision in which you need to deliver the seam is like really small. So you need to nail it. So exactly that. If you feel like you don't really have control of your wrist or fingers in order to nail that seam position it's going to leak a bit you're going to lose that and you know as I kind of said before if you don't nail your skills it's never going to swing no matter what else is and those skills are really hard to do so 100 percent buy into that as well um okay. that's okay. actually yeah. a question, just a quick side one for for you when you're yeah. thinking about swing and the ball not swinging or or teaching someone what are the things that as a bowler you'd be looking to change would it be like the position of the ball in the hand would it be like which finger you're having on the seam would it be actually moving your whole wrist or arm? Because again, this is the other thing for me, I can swing a ball at 50 miles an hour bowling horrible meadows, but that's completely different from being an elite level bowler. So just what are the things that you're consciously thinking about being like, oh, if I, you know, give myself a bit more angle, it might swing more, I might shift my fingers around. What is it you're trying to focus on at the top of your mark? Well, I think firstly, every everyone is kind of different. So yeah. Ultimately, getting that seam coming out the right way in a training environment would be the most important thing. And the answer would be you video and you video and you video yeah. and you look and you and you can work out. So someone like Alan Richardson, who I played with, I haven't got a ball. I should have got. Why haven't I got a ball? He would almost hold the ball cross seam, but he would release it kind of. I'm trying to hit a bit like. Yeah, this. he would like come right down the side of it, right? So the fingers would come down the side, and the seam would still come out perfectly. Is that kind exactly? Of the idea? Whereas you watch Keith. Keith is very upright. He's right behind it. Yeah. So for him, it is his seam will be, it'll be a tiny, tiny thing. I the, a lot of people talk about finger pressure. Um, mm. I Again, find that yeah, a little awesome. bit like you're worrying probably about something that's so small. There's probably a lot bigger things that are going on in your action that yeah. you should focus on first. So I don't, for example, it's fair to say I'm a swing bowler. I don't really ever think about finger pressure. Which, as a swing bowler, do you have like a callus on one of your fingers? This is one of the things I've been sort of working on as a, as a theory. Do you have like a, a bit on your finger where you're like, this is callus? Yeah. My is it one. your middle finger? It's your middle finger, right? For so me, for me, yeah. that's telling me that the last bit of contact you have in the ball is off your middle finger, right? So as you rip down the back of the ball, that's the bit that's applying the most pressure, the finger pressure type thing. Mm -hmm. So there was a bit of work I was doing with a bowler a while back and he was sort of leaking the ball out and there was wobble seam coming out when he's trying to swing it and he had this callus on the middle of the finger and i was like try putting that point the callus point on the middle of the seam 
Because what you're saying, what I'm saying is you're, that's the bit where you're ripping down the back of the ball and you want that to be down the seam so you can present a proper seam position. Exactly what you were saying about the guy who holds it, big sideways seam, but still rolls it down the back of the seam. Because that's all that matters is rolling the ball down the back of the seam, making sure that that seam is stable. Yes. And that, that's the advice I give to anyone right. is from a coaching point of view, that's how you go about it. You have to you have to see what's going on. The 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 things that can happen, though, is as you improve your action, you end up in slightly different positions, yep. at different points. And therefore, yep. you, you might improve your action and your wrist has gone a bit all of a sudden. And then you have to go back to the drawing board. Um, but I, I personally now, I find that my like muscles – and my body is almost locked in and just <laughs> conditioned me to come down that side of the ball. Um, but yeah, well, I like to play with some swing bowlers, right? So, you know, I said played with the same guys for like 20 odd years back at home, just club cricket stuff. And they're some of the best swing bowlers, you know, around it at our level. They just absolutely metronome swing the ball every time. You ask them, so what is it you do to swing the ball? And they're like, just happens. Just my actually is just locked into this. It's all kind of zoned in and again like brilliant if that works but as you say when sometimes you shift things around i think it's really important to understand the little bits that go into making the ball come out in the right way um mm. so that's that where is my shoulder where's my wrist where are my fingers there's sort of three different points to it and if one of those is slightly changed you might have to adjust the other in order to get it to go so i really like talking to bowlers about this sort of stuff again because i can't do it myself um, so understanding how those little bits interplay and, and well, we we obviously just did a podcast a few episodes ago, which you listened to, and Keith was like, "What?" And I've had a few messages from people I play with saying, "You don't try and swing it," and I'm like, "No, I but I set myself up to swing it by getting in a strong position, getting my angle correct, and feeling like I'm coming yeah. down the ball, and then it will swing because you need to focus more on hitting a hard length." And being aggressive than you do swinging it like swing yeah it's obviously great and i you're an aerodynamicist right so yeah it's the be it's the bee's knees it doesn't mean anything if you can't put the ball in the right space if like, this is what I'm a way, <laughs> exactly exactly so there's more important things that you need to get right first yeah 100 but that and that if you don't swing it you're still bowling well so this is why like, a good example of that so this is why like the finger pressure thing is really interesting because i think there are certain bowlers who can get the ball to swing without making any big changes to the rest of their action, just yep. by subtly changing ball in the hand, which part am I, you know, you don't have to, the whole point of the idea of using the callus that you've already got is you don't have to change anything. You're taking your natural action and then you're saying, well, how can I position the ball in my hand? Because I can put this ball anywhere I like, right? That's, that's not going to change massively how I let go of it. Can I put the ball in a way so that it complements my natural action to get the right seam position as it comes out? So that's Spot. kind of right. So that's that's kind of how I view it. I'm no biomechanicist. I'm no coach. I can't tell you how to remodel your action. But if I can film you letting go of the ball from your hand and it's coming out in a certain way, I go, well, how can we just tweak the last final bit to get that to be the right position? Because again, like from studying the science, I know what the ball needs to look like as it comes out of your hand. Anyone can go watch Jimmy. It's pretty much the easiest way to do it. Do it. You can see perfectly stable seam pointing at, at the slips either way. Yeah. And then I mean, from my perspective, no, no, you go. He's um, yeah, he, he's, he's just unreal. So he's he's the person to um, to copy. Yeah. Um, and like you know, I'll be honest. Like myself, my away swinger is very natural. I have to work very hard for my in swinger. Um, so actually, on that on that point, when you're trying to bowl an in swinger, again, this is something I've messed around with the nets. It doesn't really count because I can't land the ball where I want it to do. But I can get the ball to swing both ways just from a simple. I know what it needs to look like. What are the things you're changing from your action if you're trying to go from an away swing to an in swing? Are you trying to shift your wrist round so you're getting down the other side of the ball? Are you rolling off a different finger? Are you changing your grip? Because I think that's one of the things that is the hardest thing to do is if you start messing with all these bits and pieces. I know, again, some people drop their shoulder position and other stuff. And yeah. Jim is amazing because he doesn't do any of that. That's like why he's the best. Same action and everything is exactly the same right up until the point when you see the ball at the top of his hand and it's like, oh, I'm here versus I'm here. And he, he just has this amazing ability to change the smallest things, but get this incredible different result without messing with everything else or losing his accuracy or anything else. That's why he's so good from a, from yeah. a technical perspective. Absolutely. I mean, I think I think everyone is going to have uh, their own unique little cues. So, for example, mine would be I try to feel taller. Yeah. Um, and I just emphasize trying to be really behind the ball to the point where I can really feel it all down my forearm. If that makes sense, I really have yeah, to. Kind of like that twisting 
kind of thing. Because again, if you like you think about trying to point the ball at leg slip rather than first slip, you kind of need to get something that side of the ball. And if you're not shifting your arm over, it might have to be wrist. It might have to be, again, finger position, whatever it is, right? It's subtle because you can't not be behind the ball because otherwise you yeah. lose pace. Do you yeah. see what I mean? And it's so it's yeah, like it's, you've actually, yeah, you can't be like there. You've got to be, it's very subtle, but everyone has kind of got to, through ultimately bowling, videoing, you know, help help with friends or a good coach, but that's how you, you do it. Um, it's it's finding out you work. I was watching the IPL a couple of days ago. Sam Curran was opening the bowling. Sam Curran, classic yeah. left armour, a way swing to a left-hander, right? So like yeah. into a right way to a left. He's now got an in-swinger. He literally bowled it second over to no, second ball to Giswell, and he was like, "Hang on a minute, where's this come from?" And it's great because you can see he's gone away and he's worked on his wrist position a little bit, and has mm -hmm. now found a way of pulling that seam back into the left hander in a way that he couldn't before. So he's an example where like it's definitely doable. It's just you've got to mm -hmm. find a way that works for you. And I'm yeah. really interested in that sort of coaching aspect because it takes the sort of nerdy science I do and makes it applicable, right? Which is kind of what you want well, at the end of the day. Oh, well, I mean, I've got this theory with reverse swing, which maybe. We might not get to at this point, but you know, it's the answer is for current probably it'll be a little bit of a grip. There'll probably be a yep. subtle grip change. He'll probably feel a little bit more like he's this side of the ball, yep. and that'll be enough because his action's pretty tidy. Mm -hmm. um, for someone who's slingier, so but that Barks is obviously not with us anymore. He he would be like that because his action is very tight. Yeah. Uh, for someone who's slingy and lower arm, yeah, that, that is going to be a bigger wrist. You've got to get around the action in kind of that way in order to get it to go. Yeah, yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And then batsmen start picking it, so it loses its value, right? So that's why you can't just do it. You know, you've got to get everything in order. Again, so this is another example. So it's going to slightly on that reverse thing. People talk about people who have actions that are good for reverse, right? Like mm -hmm. this is another thing. We'll talk about dropping your arm for reverse on the bits and pieces. So from a technical bowling perspective, you shouldn't need to do anything different with your action to get the ball to reverse than when you're swinging it conventionally. Basically, what happens is the ball gets rough enough on one side that the ball does the work for you, right? So, you know, I talk about swing being different airflow on either side. When the ball is new and you have your seam doing the job on one side and the shiny side doing the other, it'll move in one direction. Once you get the ball in good enough condition and you have a rough side, the ball will automatically go in the other direction. You don't need to do anything different. It's all about the ball condition that then is going to move it in the opposite direction. So when people talk about, I'm interested to see, like, you know, when people talk about changing their action or other bits and pieces, is it something you've come across as you think, yeah. Is something you believe yeah. in? Do you, do you think it makes a difference or? You know what? Um, so I find that guys who are slingier tend to find it very easy to get the ball to reverse into a right-hander. Yeah, they're like tail, right? People talk about the tail. Yeah, so then, then picture Chris Wokes. He finds it naturally easy to reverse it away from a right-hander, which a lot of people, a lot of slingy bowlers are like... Oh, can't do that yeah um okay so, so the question for you on here is it just because they bowl the ball fuller though so like slingy bowlers they've got to get the ball up there so there's a big thing about again like the swing the longer the ball's in the air the more it swings yeah so actually a lot of the time one of the things you see in the in the lab is that when the ball stops swinging conventionally it doesn't just go dead straight it like starts reversing a little bit mm, like, a, yeah. like a small amount um, and so you see this a lot in white ball cricket where you get Chris Jordan is my favorite example. The like the tail that he gets on his Yorkers at the death, right? Yeah. Where he's just that that just a little subtle drift in and he just bowls in a way swing action and it drifts in. That to me is like a small amount of reverse, and that's around quite a lot, but you only see it when they really pitch the ball up, when you bowl a Yorker, when you bowl a really full ball. So this idea sometimes of there being reverse available to some bowlers or others. Some of it is length related, I feel, and then some of it is speed related. Because the other thing you see is the faster the ball, faster you bowl, the more you're going to get the ball to reverse. That's like again another categorical, like scientific truth that you can see when you do the study. Yeah. So what it is about the different bowlers that makes it more makes reverse easier to find for them, I think is like a really interesting question from a, both a technical and sort of a um, bowling standpoint. Yeah, it's a good one. I mean, now you mention it, quite often you'll hear people. Uh, just say, oh, I think it's swinging. I think it's reversing. And you'd be like, mm, I don't know. Because it's just, but like you say, it's, it's just stopped swinging conventionally and it just sort of tails in a little bit. So um, one of the so cool things... Still reverse, in your opinion. Yeah, yeah, it is. So one of the things that's really cool about how conventional reverse work 
um, is that when you look at it in like a uh, lab environment, conventional swing, you basically like it swings, it swings, it swings, it swings, and then it kind of stops. And the reason that it stops is either the ball gets too rough um, or you're bowling too fast. So there's like an upper speed limit you can bowl to get the ball to swing conventionally, depending on how shiny it is. And, and it's basically like a cliff edge, right? Like it just it just drops off a cliff. That's how the, the physics of it works. Whereas reverse, on the other hand, is like a slow, gradual process. So it will like start reversing and then as the ball gets rougher, it will reverse a bit more. And as you bowl a bit faster, it will reverse a bit more. So it's like really interesting how conventional swing is like a big cliff and it drops off and then reverse is like the slow process where you see a bit and then it'll go a bit more and maybe bowl 10 more herbs of spin and the ball gets a bit rougher and then it goes a bit more. Um, but that dynamic is really interesting because it's something you see in the science and I think you also see when you're watching and playing cricket as well. You've just made me think of a question there. So you talk about speed. Yeah. Could it be velocity more than speed? So, it, so here's a scenario. Let's say there's a bowler, right, who's <clears throat> who's operates between 80 and 85. Yeah. 85, though, he is trying his – he's – whatever. They, they're steaming in. That's as quick as they – that's, you know, borderline everything they've got. Yeah. Whereas they swing it comfortably at 80. Is that speed or is it that they're – is it something – velocity – So it could 100% be speed. Like when you when you put a ball in a wind tunnel and you crank up the speed, it swings, it swings, it swings, it swings, hits a certain speed and it stops, just how the physics right. works. Basically, you can't get smooth airflow over one side of the ball if it's too fast. It just doesn't happen. Uh, there's okay. like an limit on it. So that's how it works. You're shine, no matter how shiny it is, if you crank it up too fast, then it doesn't swing. Uh if it's rougher, that speed is lower. So that makes sense. So if the ball's rougher, it'll stop swinging at, say, 70 miles an hour, polish it up, then it'll be 85. So when you're operating in that 80 to 85 region, you'll get the ball to swing. Yep. The other thing, again, with that is, is like, if you're really just trying to bowl as fast as you can, how well are you nailing your seam position? Uh, there's that other element to it. Right. So there is so a technical there's, breakdown. There's a bit of technical breakdown, and there's also a bit of science to it. The other thing that's interesting is the... Um, how that rolls into the condition side of thing. So it's not technically bowling speed that makes a difference. It's this, this is gonna get very technical, but it's this fluid mechanical concept called Reynolds number, which is basically how fast you're traveling compared to how dense the air is. This is why you want the Sorry. air. To <laughs> yeah, it's, honestly, this is gonna get way too technical. So I'll just send some people to the blog. But basically right. the, the warmer it is, the higher your maximum speed is. As it gets colder, that maximum speed comes down. You talked about it being too cold to swing. Well, that's yep. because as it gets colder, the air gets denser and that top speed starts dropping with it. So the top speed might be 82 miles an hour and suddenly you're bowling at 84 and it's not swinging because the air is too cold. Ah. So there's this, there's a, it's an interesting concept in, in sort of fluid mechanics and aerodynamics that things, it's all about ratios of things. It's very rare that there's like one factor that's really important. Instead, it's yes. like a ratio of a few factors. So uh, temperature is one of them. Speed is one of them. Um, there's a few other bits and pieces. And actually what's really cool is we're very lucky that we play cricket in the speed where all the interesting stuff happens. So there's like, it's like a complete fluke that the ball is made in a certain way that the seam will allow one side to be turbulent and one side to be laminar. And we bowl in a range where we can get reverse and we can get conventional mm -hmm. swing. Because if everyone bowled at 150 miles an hour, there'd be no conventional swing. And if everyone bowled at 60 miles an hour, there'd be no reverse swing, right? So we're really lucky that just the way cricket works, we can have access to all these really cool bits. Uh, and that's just a complete fluke, but it's really cool. Cricket is a wonderful game for this kind of stuff. Um, and what <laughs> I what I like, and I think you will like as a scientist, is I actually think this swing thing, or I appreciate there's lots of moving parts, but it is solvable. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Theoretically, it is. you could solve it and bowl optimally every time you stepped on a pitch. And this is what I try and help people do. Because I've got a, you know, a thesis of 200 words of very boring science but at the end of the day if i can't help people bowl swing better like what's the point so yeah it is solvable and and when you think about those three parts the bowler what do we do you know, the other reason those three things are really interesting the bowler the ball and the atmospherics is you can control each of them to a different degree right so as a bowler you're in charge of what you do with every delivery you can change your speed you can change your seam angle you can change your backspin, whatever it is but every delivery you can do something different if you would like to the ball, well, you can't change it necessarily every delivery, but you can polish it, you can make it rough, you can adapt to conditions. 
And then finally, with the atmospheric, well, you can't control it, but you can adapt to it. You know that if, say, for example, it's really cold and it's not going to swing conventionally, well, then I can adapt to that. Actually, when it's cold, it's easier to reverse the ball. Again. Or you, you could bowl slower, though. You could bowl slower, right. exactly well, that. Yeah, right. Or you could, yeah, exactly that. Or you yeah. could you could make sure that you can shine it. Actually, so so Dale Stain is one of my favorite bowlers of all time because he had the amazing ability to slow himself down to swing the ball. Because when Dale Stain's bowling 95 mile an hour rockets, he's bowling too fast to get the ball to swing. But when he's rocking up and bowling 83 miles an hour and nailing his seam position, he's going to shape the ball. And actually, Did you listen to a podcast with him? Yeah, I loved it. It was great. I just I could listen to Dale talk about bowling oh. forever. He's amazing. But he said he talked about late swing. So you must have been a bit upset about that well no it's again my my tagline is all swing is late swing so it's like again it's all about angles so delstein was another guy who'd come wide and tall tall action and angle it at leg stump and swing it away from you and that's what made the ball feel late he wasn't a from the hand guy and also because he bowled rapid so it's always going to feel later when mm. you don't pick it up right um yeah but yeah the other the other bowler i've seen do that is joffra you know in that I think it was the second Ashes test in 2019 where everyone was like, oh, Joffrey had just come in. He bowled 97 miles an hour in the first game. And in the second game, he was like, no, I'm swinging this. I'm just going to nibble the ball around. I'm going to hit 83 to 85 miles an hour. Um, and I'm going to swing the ball and I'm going to nick everyone off and I'm going to take five wickets. And it drove me absolutely mad. That the media was like, why is he not bowling 100 miles an hour? And you're like, he doesn't need to. He can do both things. He understands inherently that there are times where you want to change what you're doing as you say, to bowl optimally the swing that you want to get on a given day. And so understanding that difference to me, what makes the elite bowlers that next level, when you have that control over the things that you do with the ball so you can access the swing when you need it, but you also have the skills to bowl 95 mile an hour rockets. Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on. And again, again, you're a scientist. So you using the word optimal is spot on. It, yeah. You know, he's going to be intuitively thinking, well, hang on, this feels like the way I should be bowling. Like We often hear stuff like, this is a wicket where you want to kiss the pitch, or this is a wicket where you want to hit the pitch hard. Yeah. And it's hard to put it into, do you know what well, I mean? I mean, it's like, it is I mean this is one of my biggest things, is I love taking phrases like that and turning them into like hard facts and numbers. I mean, some people hate that, but like the idea of kissing the pitch, well, to me, that means you want to, Get the ball up there and put a lot of backspin on the ball so that it floats up there and then when it hits the surface it reacts off it because you've got a load of backspin on the ball right yeah and, and this is kind of where i would love to be with what i do is i have an opportunity to hopefully take some of the science and the hard facts and turn that into coachable points for people who don't have the experience of finding it intuitively like you know dale stain and jimmy will have done it from a being incredible bowlers and picking up naturally but just bowling thousands of balls right finding out what works, finding out what's good. The, the way I see the science being really important is for kind of taking away that need for experience and saying like, look, we can just put together a blueprint of what you need to try and hit to get the ball to swing in these conditions. And then say, okay, well, how do we work with coaches to get your action to do that? Rather than just being like, oh, well, I was a bit round arm, so maybe you should drop your shoulder. Be like, no, no, this is what the ball needs to look like when it comes out your hand. This is what your action is doing. How can we tweak it? How can we adjust it? And then that feeds into loads of other things about like reverse swing. You know, you don't need to go out and play 40 over games in Sri Lanka to try and get experience in reverse swing. We can say, no, look, we can recreate the conditions of a reverse swing because we understand how the science works, give you those experiences and help those younger players coming through. You're spot on. And that's very admirable. And you know what? Definitely want to do something with you in future. But the, the issue you've got is, and I agree with you in principle, you could fast track it, but the experience comes in in terms of the grooved action, doesn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and where you're landing the ball, right? And the experience of actually using swing in a game, those things all happen. But in terms of like finding the technique, sometimes, again, I don't know how you felt like this is when you were coming through is like, if you were someone who said, oh, I want to learn how to do this particular skill, there might not have been an easy way of being like, well, this is how it works. This is what you need to do. This is the thing. It might have been, okay, we'll try this. Maybe it didn't quite work for your action. We'll tweak a few bits and pieces. But one of the things I try and do with like the, the talks I give to coaches and stuff, be like, look, this is a solvable problem, as we said. We know what we need to do in order to get X, Y, and Z. It's about finding ways to do that and hopefully trying to remove some of that mystery, as much as I love the mystery and the art of swing bowling, like take away some of the stuff that's harder to do and give you easier options and, and make that step up to the next level as easy and as smooth as possible. Absolutely. Hey, can, can, sorry, I know we've gone on a little while, but I've got more questions. Can I keep going with them? 
Yeah, hundred percent. As I say, it's just it's probably just um my girlfriend downstairs just being like, why is this guy talking about swing for? for it's three amazing. Hours? Isn't it? Is Bellare still a nightclub in Cambridge? Is that closed or is it still open? Uh, I have, I'm gonna be honest. I haven't been out in the middle of Cambridge for probably about five years. Uh, I'm oh, an wow. old man. But, um, I probably had a night out there but in that time. <laughs> uh, I would say no, not that I remember. That was um, the place to be. Okay, well, where was it? Out of interest, it might have been renamed. They'll just get renamed every couple of years. Oh, uh, I hope okay. this is going to be the final edit, by the way. Just this, near the this. Lion Yard. It was yeah. yeah near the so. You... Oh no, that's Lola Lowe's now. Yeah, is that what it's called? It's Lola Lowe's now. Yeah, I've been there. It's... Okay, so it's sort of up the steps and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Off the Lion Yard. Yeah, yeah. Again, I hope this makes the final right. card of the podcast. Just to I remember, I remember being at uni and uh, me and my opening bowler, uh, you know, partner Paladino. We had a big night out, and we were, <laughs> we were playing Durham the next day. Anyway, rocked up, and the wicket was naughty. You know, when you just know, yeah, and we yeah. were obviously steaming, um, and we managed to convince the captain to, we managed to convince him to bat first because any dents might harden, and then it might nip a lot. And then you've got, got a little, like, yeah, yeah, the little indents in the pitch. Yeah, we got to bowl out for 40. <laughs> and then we just had to get on with it and bowl with hangovers. And I think, um, yeah, it didn't go too well, to be honest. I think they literally got, like, 300 or something. Bowled us I've out been, again. Uh, I've been there before as a captain where, like, you rock up and you're like, I know what we want to do here. The pitch is bad, but we're going to do the hard thing first so that we can do the the, the good thing next. And then you get rolled for 40 and everyone's like, what are you doing with your life? Yeah. So, no, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got, oh, you know what? Another one. I've had that in a one day game at Canterbury under lights, and we all agreed. Uh, and Jim Trout was a captain of Warwick at the time. He was like, We are, we're going to, we're going to bowl first because we're going to chase under lights because yeah. the ball skid on. And we were like, Yes, that is yes. And then he came back and he was like, I changed my mind last minute. And we, end, and we batted first. And basically, we got like 240, and then they got them yeah. one down. In about yeah, forty overs. You know, like what? The yeah, heck? Anyway, let's get on with these. Um, if we haven't covered them, so we've covered too cold. It can be too cold to yeah, swing. Yeah, but... too cold. Air's too dense. Therefore, brings that top speed down. Harder to swing the ball. Hundred percent. Okay. Um, humidity. This is one that's often touted. Does humidity? Okay, right. Yeah. So this is this is one that's actually been studied quite a lot in like actual lab experiments because people can change humidity in a lab and you can see what it is so my big take on humidity is that it's not humidity that makes a difference when i said before it's like warm still air that's really important yeah and so when you as a player when you're walking out to the middle when you think it's humid you're feeling like your skin being sweaty right like it's warm it's sticky feels humid well actually the other thing that makes it feel really warm and sticky is when there's no wind right and the air is not cooling your skin down Right. So actually, one of the things is that it's not the humidity, it's the warm still air um, that makes a difference. So it may feel humid, it's probably not the humid, but when it feels like it's going to swing, it probably will swing because it's the same like final result. So again, right. one of those days when I was doing some measurements at Headingley, we were sat there and it was the perfect bowl first day, right? It was warm, it was sticky, the clouds were just like, you know, sat over the ground. Again, this is another one about clouds, right? There's lots of clouds around and they're not moving. The clouds are there to stay. It's probably because there's no wind around. So that's probably where you're getting your like useful atmospherics from. So the humidity thing in itself is not a factor, but days that feel humid and sticky, they're actually the ones you, you're you kind of looking for because warm still air is the thing. Right. Okay. That kind of makes sense, right? Like, Yeah. No, it, it, to me it is. Um, we'll probably listen to it again, do an edit, and it will be like way <laughs> – but to me it makes sense. Okay. Um, hopefully the listeners will – agree i'm sure they will um overcast we've talked about um the, if it's overcast probably means there's no wind hence still there's a it, you know yeah like the correlation not causation thing right it's yeah. like well actually the clouds are probably telling you something about the wind which is actually the important thing that kind of yes yeah. um what else have i got here uh okay sweat so back in the day bowlers would put mint on the ball yep uh and obviously since then saliva's banned um so essentially people are just using sweat on the ball and it isn't as good no matter what people say why would that be salty so, sweat is it just not smooth 
I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it, so again, you know, you talk about shining a ball. What you're trying to do is dissolve that grease and then use that to polish the rest of the ball, right? Yeah. So the idea of like having a mint or a sweet, the reason that was good is because that had a sugary layer to it that you could then yes. also use to polish the ball, like it, creating a new la lacquer of kind of effect. Um, the difference between sweat and saliva, I don't know. I think someone did a study on it uh, and looked at the amount of swing in test cricket, for example, uh, since the the saliva ban was introduced and actually it hasn't gone down like it's it's stayed kind of flat again i know this is like a data versus anecdote thing but i for me i think it it the only thing i could think of is it just the way that the sweat is applied saliva you can do it very precisely right like you can say i just want to dissolve this bit i just want to smooth it out if you're putting large amounts of sweat on the ball you're kind of over polishing what you need to you're using up that grease that polishability mm. well, that's a word before you need to if that makes sense so like Rather than saying, oh, I'm just going to polish this little bit with a targeted bit of saliva, I'm putting way too much sweat in the ball, I'm dissolving too much grease, the ball's getting a little bit soft, I'm, I'm using up the available shine of the ball too early, um, and therefore it doesn't swing for as long because you can't keep it shining it for as long as, you know. You're a very honest man, I reckon, Aaron. Do you know what the real answer might be? There's no difference at all. I don't know. It, it could people, well. are, people are still using mints in some way. Or oh, right, fine. Do you know what I mean? Again, <laughs> I'm not an expert ball tampering. That's like 100% not what I do. Um, so, what else? Have I got any other questions? I think, I think that that's all my questions. I, the only one I want to go back to very sure. quickly was about the brand new ball mm. and the scene, because mm. um, you can still swing that, but it's just not as optimal. Is that correct? And it and it it's not optimal because of the logos. You, you it's think? the roughness in the ball, right? It's that lacquer effect. It's not because you have two shiny sides. As I said, two shiny sides is brill. But it's the it's the fact that the majority, if not all, of new balls, when you feel the the logos and the lacquer, it's a little bit rough. You don't have like it's a ball that you've polished for ten overs is smoother than a brand new ball out of the box. That's why. Um, and and what you want is the smoothest ball possible because that's just the the best thing you can get for swing. So it's that little bit of difference. Feel the balls when they come out of the box. That's like a a classic thing that I just tell everyone to do when you're picking it. Like you still still look for your small balls that fit in your hand. Uh, the thing about dark balls is the other one that people say a lot. You want like a dark ball. So yeah. I have two theories on this. The first one is just it's harder to see. That's like the first one, right? Like as a batter, I'd rather see a brighter ball than a really dark one. Um, and then the second one is it's probably got a little bit more grease in it. it means you can kind of polish it for a little bit longer. So yeah. say when you're shining a ball, you're dissolving what's already in the leather. If it's darker and it's got more grease in it, well, then you can polish it for longer because you have more access to that stuff. Again, I haven't tested that. That's just a theory. You'll know much more about it than I will from... I'd agree theory. with you there. The yeah. second part of that, because yeah. I would argue, yes, practically, I feel like a, a darker ball is, does more. Um, but so is that you're saying for more grease. polishing it for longer you feel like you can get a really good shine in it for a long period of time is that why it feels like it's good i think so i think okay. so um again there's another yes. thing where like if the ball feels good in your hand you're going to nail your skills better like i'm well, so yes well, some balls just do shine better and invariably yeah. the darker the ball the better they shine which is obviously um, that's what you're looking for right mm, absolutely um Right. I feel like you need to go to Lola Lowe's and yeah, yeah, I'm, Lola Lola. Lola. Um, I'm actually getting up really early to do some traveling tomorrow. So sadly that's not gonna happen. But um next time next time you're down in Cambridge, we'll we'll go check out Lola Lowe's. Hundred percent. Um well look, thanks so much for your time. Um and can no, you can you let us know where where people can find you? Obviously, you've got your your handle Abriggs Cricket. That's on Yeah, so Twitter. that's that's on, on Twitter. I'm gonna be honest, I don't post a lot. Um but I, I sort of might do it. You're a lurker. Like that. Yeah, kind of. Uh, I use it for, for following other people who say much more sensible things about cricket than I do. Um, but I have a blog as well. So um, it's swingdoctor.substack.com uh, where I write a bit. There's some science stuff in there. We've just had an academic paper that's come out. So there's a little blog article summarizing like some science and how it becomes useful for, for cricket. There's a few things on watching cricket and, and measuring it and all the sort of nerdy swing stuff you'd expect from someone who's got a PhD in it. So, uh, yeah, thanks Thank very much you. for having me. I've, I've enjoyed it. I've a great, had a great time. I hope I didn't bore Keith too much. I think 100 overs and then listening to some cricket science nerd chat for an hour and a half probably probably was a bit too much on a Friday night. So uh, that's more than more than acceptable that he dropped out. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair to him, we do plan on doing some in-game stuff um, to get the kind of real experience of it. Um, yeah. And 
obviously he's been he's been injured for a little while, so yeah. he's obviously then gone and put a bit of a shift in today. So he's going to be feeling it, to be fair. But that's all part of the fun. Um, <laughs> I have to say, yeah. absolutely no problem with him ducking out at all. Um, cool. yeah. Well, look, in that case, uh, I will wrap it up, everyone. Um, just want to say this episode was brought to you by Grey Nichols. There's a discount code at the bottom of the screen if you're watching on YouTube. It is A underscore TBUP20. Uh, that's all capitals, and that's greynichols.co.uk, where you can get 20% off. Um, so, all being well, I will get the uh, the outro music on pretty well, although I do struggle with this. Normally, um, Keith does all this stuff. Um, but look, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll get you on again soon. Take it easy. See ya.